I think we're in an upswing. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of shit that I either don't like or <laughs> flat out don't give a shit about. But judging by this Raw alone coming off of Money in the Bank, guys, we are in for a lot of fun stuff. What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your June 20th post Money in the Bank Raw review. We start off the night looking at outside the building. I don't know the name of the building they were at tonight. Uh, Dean Ambrose was in a, in a cab. He gets out of the cab. He's excited to be there. Right, right, right. Grabs all his stuff. He's so excited that he leaves his new WWE Championship in the cab. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know what they're supposed to do. It's just supposed to show how erratic Dean Ambrose is. Uh, I will give them a little bit of flack here because what it does is it makes you, whether you meant it to be or not, you made the WWE World Heavyweight Championship belt something that somebody could possibly forget in a car. I get what they were trying to do, don't get me wrong, but um, I didn't like that. But we start off, we start off the night with Dean Ambrose, obviously. Here's the thing. The stuff with the shield is playing out exactly how we thought it would, but we've been talking about it forever that the fact that it's playing out exactly how we thought we would doesn't bother me. Uh, before I get into Raw, actually, I'm going to say Money in the Bank in general was great. I said in the preview with uh, Kristen and, and Guapo that there was three or four matches that I cared about and a bunch of other matches that weren't going to be worth shit, and that's pretty much what happened. What I will say before I get into my Raw review, um, scattered as usual because it's ridiculous o'clock in the morning, you got five more days, get your stuff in, get your questions in for the uh, June edition of Ask the Phoenix. I've already got some stuff there, already looks like it's going to be good. If you want to get your uh, get your voice heard on that, you got five more days. We start off as Ambrose coming down to the ring to celebrate Roddy Roddy Rock. On the rampway, we see a Raw and a SmackDown podium. So instantly you're thinking, okay, the, the, the draft we already know is coming on the 19th. It's not tonight. Why are there podiums there? Right, right, right. It turns out, over the course of the night, we find out that those podiums are there for reasons. Um, kind of like when they hang the Money in the Bank briefcase over the ring, all the Raws leading up to Money in the Bank. The podiums are there for realistically no reason. But Ambrose comes down to the ring to Big Dean, Chance, Big You Deserve It, Chance, etc. Ambrose comes in. Talking about his long night in Vegas, talking about all the different things. I did this, I did this, I did this. Oh, and I won a ladder match. And then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. And oh, I became the WWE Champion. It's fucking great. Uh, Mox Rollins a little bit saying he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and what goes around comes around. Hard work and busting your ass pays off. You know, one, one calls himself the man, one calls himself the guy. I don't care if you call me the dude, as long as you call me the new WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Um... Gets cut off by Roman, because you figure it's going to be Rollins, but it's Roman. <laughs> Saw a sign in the crowd, because they focus on it for a second, that says, It never rains in Arizona. Which is lame as fuck, but it made me smile. It made me... I, I found it funny. But that doesn't mean much, does it? Uh, last night wasn't my night, it was your night, congratulations. How did it feel cashing in on Seth, you know, their buddy-buddy you gotta tell me how it was to fuck him over type thing. Um, you get the typical, you can't wrestle chant that Roman usually gets, but more noticeably than usual, you also get the yes he can chant, so you get the he can't wrestle, yes he can the uh, the, the the volume of the yes he can was kind of surprising um, Dean says, you know, don't get it twisted, I would have cashed it in on you too, I was going to leave as champion last night um, Roman look, takes a look into the crowd, you know the high pitch voices are chanting, yes he can, the low pitch voices are chanting, you can't wrestle so he tells all the dudes in the crowd that they need to drink their beer and simmer down, and reminds them all that he does have a rematch. Rollins comes out, says, talks about how he's worked for seven months to come back, and I beat Roman Reigns clean, and Ambrose stole it, and roddy roddy ra. Rollins and Roman bicker to the point where I stopped writing down what they were saying because it got repetitive, and then they're interrupted by Shane, who congratulates Ambrose twice. He congratulates him on winning the ladder match, and he congratulates him on using the the briefcase appropriately and making it work to his advantage and walking out as the uh, WWE Champion. But he says, you know, 
we've got a new dilemma on our hands. We've got two guys with a legitimate claim of a rematch. So we're going to have a number one contenders match, Roman versus Rollins. Now, it's not going to happen next week or next month because with the draft coming, we don't know where these guys are going to scatter and where they're going to land. So we're going to have that number one contendership match for the title at Battleground tonight on Raw. Oh, yes. Then we get a little preview package of the draft. Um... Basically, they talk about it throughout the night, but I'm just going to say it now. Uh, Tuesday, July 19th is the first live SmackDown. That's where they're going to have the draft. That's why the podiums are there. They're going to name the um, they're going to name the general managers, and then the general managers are going to do their, all their drafting on that night. Which makes me think at least that one SmackDown is in fact going to be three hours, which is kind of scary, isn't it? We got Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens, and here's the deal. <laughs> all the time, all the time, all the time, you hear people complaining about, oh, we've seen this match too many times, we've seen this match too many times. Now, I'm sorry, I like Kevin Owens, and I do like Sami Zayn, but as great as these guys are, you got to break them up, and you got to have them do something else. Kevin Owens, without Sami Zayn here, went on and feuded with John Cena, and now... They're all th they're always thrown into these multi-person matches. They're always fighting each other. They're always on the opposite ends of tags. They're always um, something we touched on a lot in the Money in the Bank preview. Actually, these guys are always in each other's shit. They're like twins. That the WWE is too nervous to separate. I like these guys. I like their matches. Stop for a while, at least for a while. But anyway, because this match was slow and awkward, and I don't really know why. Uh, Owens is limping as he comes down to the ring, which does remind me of one of the best spots of the night at Money in the Bank was the Michinoku driver that uh, that Sami Zayn did to Kevin Owens. Not because the Michinoku driver is an awesome move, and it is, but because he did it on the ladder. Not only did he do it on the ladder, but he did it on the ladder up on its end, so it's basically like you know, the metal spine of the ladder versus the very, very not metal spine of Kevin Owens. So I was surprised, actually, to be perfectly honest with you, I was surprised we saw Kevin Owens competing on Raw tonight. They trade punches right away, Owens bails, Owens eats the apron edge, moon so and uh, Sami Zayn hits a moonsault off the rail. Owens eats the guardrail, Zayn eats the guardrail, and the post running Sinton by Owens as we go to commercial break. Owens rides a headlock, there's a takedown, Zayn blocks the running Sinton and dumps Owens outside. Somersault suicide dive by Sami Zayn, chops by Owens, super kick by Owens, full Nelson overhead suplex by Zayn was damn pretty, I'll give him that. Another super kick by Owens, a roll up, and Zayn gets the win. For reasons, um, like most of their matches, Kevin Owens gets the majority of the offense and Sami Zayn gets the win. For reasons. Afterwards, there's a brawl and a pull apart, and Kevin Owens threatens to powerbomb Sami Zayn off the rampway, which is great, except this is WWE in 2016, and we almost know, we know that that's not going to happen. So while 10 years ago, that would have been another, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, now it's just an, oh, why are you doing that? Just, you know, threaten to do something smaller so that we think it might actually happen. If you threaten to do something like that, we know it's not going to happen. So it's a catch-22. We come back from commercial break, and they're brawling backstage, and there's a bunch of security guards and two officials in the back breaking it up. Those two officials are Fit Finley and Road Dog, which made me smile. John Laurinaitis wanders out on stage looking like he's lost, walks up to the SmackDown podium, plugs the network, plugs the draft, says he wants to be the SmackDown general manager. Shane comes out to the one side, treating him like a senile old man, you know, sort of, psst, John, psst, John, what are you doing? I want, I want to run SmackDown. Well, that's never going to happen. We're never going to have somebody from the authority. We're never going to have a corporate yes man like you running SmackDown. In fact, it's going to be me. Um, both Shane and Stephanie have been saying that it's going to be them for a while. It better be one of them. It better be the two of them running the opposite shows. If they pull some swerve where they each choose somebody to run the respective shows, I'm going to be pissed because I don't really care. I want to get to the point where we bring back the Battleground pay-per-view and we've got Team Stephanie versus Team Shane. That has to happen at some point. While Shane is getting rid of uh, Johnny Ace, John Laryngitis, uh, and Zoin Cass come out, and they mock John Laryngitis, and it, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the hell you call it, Enzo and Shane McMahon high-five with their shoes because they both have 
really weird shoes. It's it's awkward because Shane's old now. <laughs> I'm just putting that one out there. Edging, ed, wow, Edging Christian. Enzo and Cass. You know why? Because in my shorthand, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, I just put Enzo and Cass as ENC. The last time there was a tag team in my notes referred to as ENC, it was Edge and Christian. Holy Christ, I need to maybe not do that. Enzo and Cass versus the Vaudevillains. Again, for reasons. They try to make the match seem relevant by replaying the concussion footage from last month, which is something I'm sure Enzo loves. Enzo and English start off with a side headlock by Enzo, knocked down by English, and a double team by the villains. A smackdown, sorry, a snapmare, not a smackdown, because it's Monday. Snapmare and an elbow drop by Gotch, and a headlock by English. Stomps by English and Gotch, Gotch eats the turnbuckle, Cass gets the tag, and that's basically it, isn't it? Knockdown, slam, empire elbow, boot by Cass, fall away, slam by Cass, and an error, Enzo gets the win for Enzo and Cass. Vaudeville, just stop. Go back to NXT, maybe? I, I, I'm not saying that I feel like I say this all the time. I'm not saying that there are not a talented tag team. They're two individual talented wrestlers, whatnot, and whatever. But it's just not happening for you guys. Go off into the you know NXT WWE middle void where the Ascension is currently residing. Oh yes. Uh, Styles comes out. Says, you're all happy, but I'm not. I dreamed of that match with John Cena for years. Um, I don't even care. Despite the ending, yeah, the, the ending was kind of shit. Cena versus Styles was at least tied for match of the night on Sunday. I'm just putting that one out there. That's my opinion. Disagree if you want. I dreamed of that match for years. The match was tainted by the club. They had no reason to be there, and they and they... We all, I and John and the public, all deserve an apology. Gallows and Anderson come out saying they were just trying to help. Style says, you just gave Cena an excuse for me beating him. You owe me an apology. The club apologizes. He calls out Cena. The crowd is singing John Cena sucks, as they do. Cena says he doesn't need an apology. You broke the contract. And the club apologizes to John. You needed, you know, you're struggling here in WWE. You're drowning. You needed a win to survive. That's why you did what you did. You could be congr you could be getting congratulated right now because you could have beaten me, but now you're not being congratulated. You know what? Wins are one of the things that gets you success in the WWE, but so does being a man. You know, you won't... He comes up with this line. And it sounds really good, and it sounds like a good dig until you really think about it. He says, you've only got two things in life, you know, your word and your balls, and you don't have either one. So you've only got two things that you don't have. <sighs> John Cena insults are just kind of there. You know, the club did you guys a, did you a favor, now you have an excuse for me beating you. Hey, but if you want to get your frustration out, take one, take one, pick one of the club and, and beat them up tonight. He says, oh, that's fine, I'll take you, Cena, Styles, let's go. He said, you didn't let me finish. Pick one of the club other than me. So he says, you know, it doesn't matter. It's going to be Cena versus the club anyway. I don't even care. You know, pick somebody type thing. Club has a little huddle. You're going to face Carl Anderson tonight, and we're going to go away because I'm a man of my word. So we come back from commercial break, and indeed, it is Cena versus Anderson with the club not at ringside. The whole match, though, and this is where i got to give John Cena a little bit of credit. He squashes Anderson fucking hard in this match, but I will say, he played up the worry of, of you know, being concerned with the rest of, because let's be real, the way WWE books John Cena, a a a a a a they, they could squash the entire friggin' club in one night, couldn't they? Um, but he plays it up so that every time he does something, he's looking up to the ramp, and the cameras look up to the ramp to make sure that nobody's coming back down. But let's just see how this goes. The match starts beat down. Mud hole by Cena, suplex by Cena, clothesline by Cena, front slam by Cena, clothesline by Cena, side slam by Cena, five knuckle shuffle by Cena, attitude adjustment by Cena, three on one beat down by the club that goes on for a while. And I almost thought, okay, this is where they're going to return Randy Orton. But they didn't. They just beat the crap out of John Cena. Club hits the magic killer, Styles hits the Styles clash, and they go out with their heads high. Cena goes out on his back. Not bad. It's not that, you know... I don't know. Because with something like this, when it, when it goes on as long as it did, you expect somebody's going to come down. Either one of the tag teams that's feuding with, with Anderson and Gallows, 
somebody else that's got a problem with Styles, somebody else that's making a return because we know Orton's coming back soon and we know there's a couple of other people coming back soon. You expected something to happen and it didn't. And for a second I was disappointed, I'm not going to lie, because you expect something to happen it doesn't happen, obviously you're going to be disappointed. But, you know, from the Smark point of view, from the indie fan point of view, from the Cena hater point of view, we had a segment where Cena got the shit kicked out of him and that was it. You know, sir, there's some people dancing in the streets or jerking it in the corner. Anyways, um, <laughs> one of the things I did not care about last night whatsoever, got into a long Twitter debate with my good friend Kristen, who joins me for the previews and we do the recaps and all that sort of thing, um, about the natty heel turn at the pay-per-view. My simple point is, and I know she disagrees with me, and that's okay. Shout out to her, go check out the Black Hat Feline channel. Um, they turned Natty, who I don't care about in the slightest. And we're going to get into this again with Charlotte later on, but um, you need to turn somebody when it's most impactful. Best example of a turn, probably ever, is uh, Hulk Hogan turning and, and becoming part of the NWO. The entire world was invested, no matter what you think about Hulk Hogan now, the entire world was invested in Hulk Hogan as like our one pillar of, of goodness and whatever. I don't give a shit about Natty. I don't give a shit why WWE in the past couple of months thinks she's suddenly relevant again. I don't give a shit about whose side she's on, and I don't care that she's suddenly being mean. I don't want her on my TV, is the bulk of it. I'll keep Charlotte on my TV, who's pretty much falls in the same boat, if we can just, you know, forget that Natty's a thing and recognize that there are so many more relevant women on the roster. Becky cuts a decent promo backstage about what happened last night about how, about the uh, the pattern of betrayal that she's gone through since her debut, which is entirely true. She was turned on by Charlotte. She was turned on by Paige. Now she's turned on by Natty. You know, she tr changes it up so that now she's going to have like a one strike and you're out policy. And, you know, it's time to look at it for me, time to toughen up and stop being naive. And, you know, big character developing promo. Uh, and then she gets jumped by Natty for a reason. She doesn't really get jumped by Natty. Natty just kind of pushes her into a table. Because that's vicious. And then she goes to, and she she cuts this rambling, ranting, I don't even know, keeps on calling her Beck for reasons. And it's, it's, it's so shit. <laughs> it really is just so shit. She wasn't particularly invested in being a good person. Now you can see that she's really not invested and or doesn't know how to be a bad person. Um, she hasn't been a, a heel that I gave a shit about since the Divas of Doom. And how long ago was that? Oh, yes. Anyways, Baron Corbin squashed Zack Ryder. I wrote notes, but I don't care. <laughs> they did a flash thing of all the different video effects that have uh, ever incorporated the Wyatts, and Michael Cole tells us that they're going to be back later tonight. Now, they could have just done the graphic thing, because there wasn't anything attached to it. There wasn't any message. And you could have had the commentators just say, like, I don't know what you could say. Um you know, what the hell was that, or, oh my god, what is he going to do next? And you got Michael Cole, calm as hell, eh, yeah, the Wyatts are returning tonight, fuck off, Cole. I defend the commentator, I defend WWE in general, most of the time, you guys know, but in the past couple of weeks, there's certain things that I'm just getting really sick of, and Michael Cole is one of them, let's be real. Uh, Paige cuts a backstage promo, owning Charlotte, and it's fucking beautiful. Which leads into Paige versus Charlotte for the Women's Championship. Paige has two non-title victories over... Uh, she has two non-title victories over Charlotte recently. One was last week, one was I don't know how long ago. Uh, because WWE is like, oh yeah, we have this massive asset in our women's division named Paige. Uh, maybe we should use that and not boring people that have had personality ectomies. Um, <laughs> but it's good. Honestly, Charlotte is good in the match too. I'm not taking anything away from her in-ring ability, just the fact that she isn't a person with any substance other than I'm a mean person and now I have a sidekick that helps me cheat, therefore I'm a heel, therefore boo me, therefore look forward to my matches, except, oh wait, no. Collar and elbow tie up and a takedown by Charlotte, side headlock by Paige and a boot and a tackle and a drop kick, 10 knees in the corner by Paige, Dana pulls Charlotte out, friggin' Paige hits a quick shot to Dana, but that gave Charlotte a chance to hit her with a shot on the outside as well as we go to commercial break. I would rather see more Dana Brooke than Natty or Charlotte. I'm just putting that one out there. 
Figure four headlock rolling slams by Charlotte as we come back from commercial break. Pin reversal sequence. Two super kicks and a running knee by Paige. Boot by Charlotte and a fallaway slam by Paige. Two. What? So my writing sucks. Second rope front face lock and a moonsault by Charlotte. Super kick and a rampage. Lots of bullshit from Dana Brooke saves the match for Charlotte. And there's a two on one beatdown. And then we have the return of Sasha fucking Banks, who takes down Dana Brooke in the aisle with one shot, which is great. <laughs> Dana Brooke's built up to this big, you know, imposing fucking powerhouse. Sasha Banks, smallest girl on the roster, knocks her out with one punch. Fucking yes. Uh, Banks statement on Charlotte, Sasha, and Paige stand tall. Now, here is the thing. They could do a really cool... They could do a really cool story here where Paige and Sasha have a series of matches. Have Paige and Sasha have a best of five series, and the winner of the best of five series gets to face Charlotte. Problem is, I care more about the Paige versus Sasha match than I will when one of them goes up against Charlotte. And Charlotte's the one with the belt. That's bad. Oh, yes. Charlotte and Natty stop being anchors on the division. Oh, yes. Wyatt's come out, and... Um, it's kind of funny because why um, social media, Twitter, etc., Instagram is blowing up with the pictures that are going around of Bray Wyatt, who is excessively smaller than he was before he got injured. Um, you know, he's been working out, he's been doing whatever he's been doing. You know, it looks like he's got himself into pretty good shape. So the Wyatts come out, and well, three quarters of the Wyatts come out. Wyatt, Rowan, and Strowman. There's no Harper. I'm thinking there's going to be some shenanigans there, or there's a specific reason that there's only three of them. And there is. We'll get there in a second. Before Wyatt can even fucking get into his promo, he can't even do the whole, you know, spooky Bray Wyatt thing because the welcome back chant is so loud he can't help but laugh. And he sort of tips his hat to the crowd. You know, did you miss me? You know, what I'm, what I'm about to say, you know, is either a warning or a blessing or any of this. We, we've been locked away for a while, but make no mistake, the Wyatts are stronger than ever. And then... Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. This is maybe this is just me. Maybe this is only big to me. Maybe this maybe I'm the only one that popped for this. In the middle of all the dark, gloomy ambiance of a Bray Wyatt promo. Brother Bray, don't you dare be sour and the fucking new day come out. It's great. And they make fun of the Wyatts, you know, friggin' Xavier Woods looks like he's been hypnotized. They all say that Rowan's got a big booty. Wyatt's got the line of the night. He says, young men, you do not know what you have done. I can see into your future. And new day falls. New day falls. So if we go to Battleground, and what we're getting in the interim is New Day versus the Wyatt family, I'm okay with that. But long term... I want, bring back Harper from wherever he is, you know, down in the swamp, taking care of the trailers or whatever the hell he's doing. No offense to anybody that lives in trailers. Bring in Finn Balor for the club. Club Wyatt's Survivor Series. Especially when apparently, rumor is not confirmed, apparently Survivor Series is in Toronto. Oh yes. <laughs> Newsflash, guys. I still don't give a shit about Darren Young and Bob Ackland. I know. I know. It's shocking. You know who I give a shit about even less than Darren Young and Bob Backlund? Titus O'Fucking Neal. We're supposed to have Rusev versus Titus O'Neal because of what happened at the pay per view last night, where Titus O'Neal was unsuccessful and, you know, Rusev went and told his kids afterwards that he was unsuccessful. So here are my notes for this match. Here, uh, verbatim, I don't care, the kid angle is lame, fuck Titus O'Neil, match never starts, bullshit sloppy brawl. Oh yes. Those are my notes for this abhorrent segment. Rusev, by far, is not my favorite superstar on the roster, the US title is the most worthless title in the WWE, but both Rusev and the United States Championship deserve better than Titus O'Fucking Neal. Oh yes. But we get something better. It's good. We get Roman versus Rollins with Ambrose on commentary. Number one contendership for the match at Battleground with Ambrose is on the line. Tackled by Roman in a back elbow and a corner spear to start. Rollins eats the turnbuckle. They trade punches on the outside. Rollins eats the guardrail, eats the table, eats another table, boot by Rollins and a neckbreaker and a boot to the head. 
Neckbreaker by Rollins, a mud hole stomp, a drop kick, and a headlock, a kitchen sink by Rollins, who tosses Reigns outside into the guardrail. Clothesline by Rollins, and two boots by Roman on the outside as we go to commercial break. Backpack sleeper by Rollins as we come back from commercial break. Right hands by Roman. Insiguri by Rollins. They trade punches and headbutts. Ambrose on commentary is great. He's like, you might not want to do that. You're headbutting a Samoan, which is fucking great. Ambrose was not the greatest on commentary, but got all his points in. It was really good. Flying Lariat by Roman. Roman needs a turnbuckle. Suicide dive by Rollins. One arm Batista bomb by Roman, which is impressive nonetheless. Uh, Superman punch by Roman. Springboard knee by Rollins. Uh, drive by by Roman's. In another Insiguri by Rollins on the commentator table. Roman spears Rollins over the Spanish announce table to get the very predictable double countout. Oh my God, it's a draw. Oh my God, what are they going to do? <laughs> Shane McMahon comes out, says this isn't how it's going to go down. We need a number one contender. Ambrose grabs the mic and cuts friggin' uh, Shane McMahon off and says, you know what, this Shane, we're going to do it a bit differently. I don't care. We're doing it my way. I'll fight them both. Shane says, you know what, I'll do you one better. Not only are you going to fight both of them, you're going to fight both of them at the same time and makes the Shield triple threat match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship match at Battleground, and then Dirty Deeds for everybody involved, which is great. Now, I've been saying it for a long-ass while. Do the triple threat at Battleground. Have it end in some fucked-up non-finish. Do the rematch of the triple threat match at Sur at SummerSlam. There we go. Got there in the end. Um, at SummerSlam, in the hell in the cell. WWE, my contact information is down below. You want me to write for you? I'm right here. The th the <sighs> Raw was fun. Like, there's a lot of shit. I don't care about Natty. I don't care about Charlotte. I don't care about Titus O'Neil. I don't care about Darren Young. But the rest of it was at least passable. Not the best promo exchange between AJ Styles and John Cena, but it got the job done. John Cena absolutely wiped the floor with Carl Anderson. I don't know why, for all that stuff to happen... Carl Anderson needed to be a ragdoll and not put up any fight at all. I don't understand that. Um, the 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 promo session at the beginning between the three Shield members, it seemed a little bit by the numbers, but that's only because we've seen this triple threat match coming for about a year and a half now. So it, was, it wasn't like we were going to see anything new, like we were waiting to see what would happen next. It was more like we knew where everything was going. We were waiting for everything to fall into place. So I don't think... From a WWE to fan and back to WWE perspective, I don't think they could have made that surprising because we all knew what was coming. But we wanted what was coming. So it's good. It's just not surprising. So the opening segment was a little meh. Um, Zayn versus Owens, I already told you what I thought about that. It's happened way too many times. And these guys are great, but that match tonight was nothing spectacular. Um, if we're going to get New Day versus the Wyatt family, that'll be good for a laugh, if nothing else. Uh, Sasha Banks, Paige, and Becky Lynch all need to be pushed, like, fucking huge on the main roster. And we're getting the triple threat match that we've all wanted for a long-ass time. We're keeping John Cena out of the title picture, so the haters will be happy. And this Raw did literally everything that we we needed it to do going forward from money in the bank and taking the first steps towards the draft towards battleground and towards obviously SummerSlam. anyways i'm out of breath as people have <laughs> vehemently told me in my comment sections before i always sound like i'm out of breath it's summer and it's hot and it's ridiculous o'clock and I'm kind of stumbling over my words, like I usually do. So for the people that have mentioned that in the past recent little while, I'm sorry for that. I, it is what it is. Um, lost my train of thought. Put your questions down uh, for the next Q&A. And if you know anybody else that wants to participate in the Q&A or might be interested or might find it fun or whatever, please pass it on to them, as you guys have been doing. Uh, much appreciated. And... I wish I had more to say about this Raw. Money in the Bank was fun. This Raw was fun. I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I'll talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, I'm tagging out. Please get Charlotte and Natty off my TV.